All right, thanks again, David. Um, so next up is Rebecca Mercer. She is a protocol researcher um, on the CODA protocol, and she'll be helping us learn pretty in detail about the world of SNARKs. So let's please give a warm welcome to Rebecca. Great, so everyone can hear? Yes? Cool. Great. So uh, moving on from the talk about like the social side of why we shouldn't trust snarks, I'm going to explain to you why snarks work and uh, where this like whole trusted setup comes from and how this fits into the rest of how snarks work. So uh, how do I go? Great. So snarks are like notoriously complicated, and zero knowledge proofs in general were discovered in 1987, and the New York Times made this nice article about them. And ever since 1987, we've been trying continually to make them like smaller and faster, and be able to prove more things with them. And it's been, you know, pretty difficult. Uh, so Zcash wrote this article like, "What are zk snarks? Who knows?" And then. This guy comments on this blog post about zero knowledge proofs, like, oh, I'm just struggling a bit with this time machine thought experiment. And then, like, Vitalik does his heroic set of blog posts trying to describe, like, what ZK snarks are. Um, so, this is all great, but, you know, even Vitalik's have trigger warnings because snarks are complicated. So, Right, so the question is like, how do we understand ZK snarks? Do we need to know about elliptic curves? Do we need to know about pairings? Do we need to know what snarks are? We forgot. And then the, <laughs> the next question is like, what is R1CS? What is a QAP? What is PCP? And what is an IP? Because there's this diagram that Vitalik uses and the Zcash people use, and it has all of these acronyms in, and there's seven stages, and every one of these stages is like, if you don't know any one of the stages, then looking at seven things which you don't know any of them, it's like extremely intimidating. So the point of this talk is like, we, I will show you what all of these like seven things look like. This kind of snark construction follows this nice story, but obviously if you look at the papers which introduce these things, you don't see a story, you just see pages of notation, and it's, like, it's kind of, I mean, even for me, it's kind of intimidating. Um, but it doesn't have to be. So first of all, like we, what do we want to know? So the two questions which I'm going to answer are pretty much like, what do we want to achieve in terms of properties from our zero knowledge proofs? And then how can we achieve those? So notably missing from this slide is like, why do we want zero knowledge proofs? And this is for two reasons. One is like, there's a lot of motivation talks out there and like maybe you have your own ideas. And then the other one is like, I think it would be cool if people came up with like more and more use cases of snarks. Uh, I don't think they need to be used just in this like one specific place with like private private cryptocurrencies, like zero knowledge proofs in general can be used for a variety of applications. And this is one of the things that makes them complicated to talk about because a lot of the work is in making statements that you care about into statements that you can prove things efficiently about. So you kind of understand that. Like if I had a proof of the Riemann hypothesis or something, um, then taking this proof, which would be like lines of writing and proving it in a cryptographic way, like this, even getting to a point where you can prove things about it even before you even prove them is complicated, um, right? We don't live in a world where we speak in polynomials, for example. Um, so I'm introducing my prover and verifier, right? So the situation of zero knowledge proofs is there's a prover who wants to prove something to a verifier. And right, the prover has some secret information that they don't want to reveal to the verifier, and this is what uh, the zero knowledge part of zero knowledge proofs are. And then there are a bunch of other properties that we want from this proof system too. But pretty much there's like a statement that's known to both prover and verifier, and then the prover has some, it's called a witness, that satisfies the statement. So the statement could be like, I know x such that x plus five equals eight, and then the prover could know the number three. So like th three plus five equals eight. Um, and they could prove this, but without telling the verifier that the answer is three. Um, so, right, so properties we want to achieve in more words. The first property is called completeness, and this is that if the prover knows the answer to this question or has a witness for this statement, the verifier will accept that the prover knows the answer. So if, you, if you're proving a true thing, then the verifier accepts the proof. It's like, good. Um, 
Then the next thing is like, if the prover does not know the answer and tries to make a proof anyway, then the verifier is not convinced that the prover knows the answer, which means like, if you're trying to prove, if you're trying to lie, the verifier will catch you. And this is called soundness. And the reason why it has so many stars is because there's like a lot of different flavors of soundness, which we'll get to one in like the next slide. Um, the, wait, what just happened? Oh. Then property number three is, the malicious verifier learns nothing other than whether or not the proven knows the answer, and this is zero knowledgeness. Um, so they just learn the bit. They just learn like either they know or they don't. Oh, these are old slides. Right, but then so then in zk snark specifically, we have these other. So zk snark, like taking one step backwards, stands for zero knowledge. Which, which is the last property we just saw, succinct, which just means constant size. So the proof is constant size. Like, whatever, however complicated the statement that you're proving things about is, uh, the actual proof itself is constant size. So this is like succinct. Then the N in zk snark stands for non-interactive, which means you don't want this prover and verifier actually to have to talk to each other. So the prover can just send a thing. So she can like make it by herself and send it, and then anyone can verify. So this is how we can, for example, use zk snarks for Zcash, because like you don't have to interact with every person using Zcash to be able to verify the proofs yourself, right? You just see these big blobs on the blockchain and then you can in some way verify them. Um, yeah, and then the, the arc in snark means argument of knowledge. So the argument bit captures like this soundness of like you can't fake, yeah, you can't convincingly fake something. And then of knowledge means that you, you actually have the knowledge. So in the x plus five equals eight example, the prover actually knows the number three. They don't just know that like maybe some x exists which satisfies this problem. The prover really knows three. Um, right, argument of knowledge. Uh, great, so here's our prover and verifier again. So here is the, you can't really, the screen is like, oh well. So here's the first four things in this diagram. So the alternative title of this talk was like, how I learned to stop worrying and love this diagram. And this is the diagram that Vitalik uses and zk snarks people use. And the, this is the first four blocks in the diagram and this is kind of the encoding thing. So what you do is you take a computation and then you form an algebraic circuit. Then R1CS means rank one constraint system and QAP means quadratic arithmetic program. And so the next four things we're gonna talk about are these, these four things. Um, Great, so algebraic circuit, this looks like this. These squiggles are my multiplications. And so what this algebraic circuit would look like, so we have some computation. In this case specifically, the computation is x1 times x2 times x3. These squiggles mean times, I'm not a very good drawer. Um, and we are proving we know x1, x2, and x3 equals some y. And this y, uh, right, is, so this is, so the function would just be like x1, x2, x3 equals y. As an algebraic circuit, it looks like this. So in algebraic circuits, each of the multiplication gates have two input wires and right, one output wire. Um, right, so this is this computation written out for you. And then what we need to do to turn this into a rank one constraint system is like we need to flatten it. So now every equation that we have can only have like two unknown elements multiplied together at most. And this is pretty much essential uh, for the way that snarks work in, at the moment and the, like, the world we live in. Like the tools that we have um, make it so you, just, you can just times together two unknowns at a time. So in this case, we have like this u, which is an intermediate variable, equals x1 times x2. And then we label this wire that's coming out of that multiplication gate u. Do you see how that makes sense? Um, and then the next thing that we do is we times together the third unknown input, which is x3, with this u, and we get the output. So each of these is just, just doing like one multiplication. There's never like unknown thing times unknown thing times unknown thing. It's only two at a time. Um, then the other interesting thing is like if there's an addition gate, then you, have I drawn a diagram? No. 
if there's a deficient gate, then you kind of just incorporate this into one of the multiplications. So if this bottom wire instead was like x plus three, then you could just do u and then like in brackets x plus three. You wouldn't need an additional gate to do an addition. Uh, you get them for free. So what does a rank one constraint system look like? So a rank one constraint system is we put these like flattened versions of these equations into <laughs> vectors. And so we have these three vectors and then we have a solution vector. So these dots mean like inner product, which means if you have two vectors of the same length, you multiply together the entries that are in like the corresponding slots and then add them all up. We'll, we'll get to them. And so what this SA multiplied by SB minus SC is proving is that the two input wires in each case, I feel like there's a thing I should do. The two input wires in each case uh, equal the output. So you would have like, if we had A as like the upper wire in each case and B as the lower wire in each case, then C is the output wire in each case. And so this checks one at a time that the gates are consistent. Um, really? Interesting. Oh, cool. My talk's going to be shorter than it was. Um, right, so... Really? Huh. Uh, so, yeah. So the next thing that we do is we take, so what you do is you make these into these vectors, and then, but as I just said, with this equation, you have the, for example, the upper input times the lower input equals to the output for each gate. So this means that if you want to then go ahead and check the, um, the entire circuit is consistent. Each of this, this equation checks that one gate is consistent. So if you wanna check the entire circuit is consistent, then what you need to do is you have one of these checks for every single gate. So what you do instead of this is you instead make them into polynomials. And this is a little bit uh, tricky to explain without pictures. Um, but instead of having like this gate represented and then this next gate represented, you instead put these vectors and you take the corresponding entries from each vector. Like, so for example, you take all of the vectors which represent an upper wire with these like two inputs equals output. So this guy and then this guy, yeah, the upper wires and you make them into a polynomial. Then you take all of the people who represent all of the inputs that represent a lower wire and you make those into a polynomial and then you take all of the outputs, so all of the Cs, and you make them into a polynomial. And then what you can do is evaluate this polynomial at a point. Um, and so what this allows you to do, which is kind of confusing to follow with absolutely no pictures, um, is it allows you to, instead of having this one check per gate, per arithmetic gate, you have one check, you just have one check. <laughs> That's cool, right? <laughs> um, yeah, so you can check the whole entire system of equations is consistent with just one check instead of like one per gate, which is huge. And this is called a quadratic arithmetic program. And the, there's this cool result. And it says that quadratic arithmetic programs are like, a very good thing to prove snarks about. I mean, to create snarks about. That's pretty much what it says. So, right, so in our case, the polynomials would only be degree one because we only have these two gates. But if you have a lot of gates, then this is really a huge saving going from like verifying every single gate to verifying one, one thing. It's like extremely huge. Um, right, cool. But you're like, what, it, what does this do? What are we doing? What is any of this? Um, and this leads us on to the last three things which are in this huge diagram, which people use to explain snarks. And this is where all the cool stuff comes in. So, so far what we've done is just encoded like a function into a form that it's easy to prove snarks about. And like this is where then the, I mean the bulk of the cool results are. Um, so PCPs. Uh, so PCP means probabilistically checkable proof. And what the PCP theorem says, which is like, I mean, mind blowing to me, um, is that if any NP statement, which means any statement that we can like verify efficiently, like we can verify efficiently on this world that we live in, um, any statement like this can be read from in a constant number of places to produce a proof with constant soundness error. Um, so, right. So this is kind of tricky because you read from a proof 
like my proof of like a mathematical theorem, you read from this proof in a constant number of places to make a constant size proof, which then has constant soundness error. But then, and then there's this great result that says this can be made zero knowledge with small overhead, which means from pretty much from the PCP theorem and this like follow-up work, we have that you can make constant size zero knowledge proofs for any statement. This is, I mean, this is I'm world changing. <laughs> um, so what are PCPs? So a PCP is uh, you right, take from points originally, from you take different points in the proof and you just like read these points and then you have like this convincing proof. But this proof has constant soundness error, right? And we actually in the world want, in like the cryptography world, want uh, extremely small soundness error. So this could be anything under a half pretty much, it could count as your constant, it could be like some constant fraction. But we don't want to be convinced of a fake proof some constant amount of times, so that would be terrible. So what we need to do is repeat this PCP theorem. And this is where the next two slots in the diagram come from. Because like, what does it mean to repeat, repeat this? Right. Um, so there's two different ways in which people repeat. And the first way is called linear PCPs. And what this means is instead of the original PCP theorem which, in which you take like you sample from a number of points in the proof. This one you sample linear combinations of the proof. So what it, what it seems like is someone is sending you a number of queries instead of where they would originally have sent you one query. And then you from this one proof uh, take the results of all of those queries on, in your proof and send them all of the answers to that just on this one proof. Uh, and this is a linear PCP, which is the next step in the seven <coughs> stages to a snog. Um, right, and then, right, so this is what it would look like if you had a prover and verifier. He sends like a different uh, certain amount of queries, and then the prover samples all of these queries from the same proof, and like some of them overlap, but this is completely fine. Then another way to think about, oh, um, right, then another way, the next square is like linear interactive proofs. So another way to think about how we go from like this constant. Uh, soundness error to negligible soundness error. A different way of like how we repeat the PCP pr process is that you instead, you have this relaxation that allows you to use rounds. And so the verifier and prover in this case uh, interact a number of times, as you can see, and each time they, the verifier in this case sends like a point query and then the prover samples from these points of like one proof, sends it back, the verifier sends some more points, the prover creates another proof. Um, right, and so what I think happens in, in, in practice is, is these are uh, uh, used in combination. So this is a linear interactive proof, another one with linear PCPs. And together they create, um, right, what is used in practice. Wait, what happened? So, right, so the way that the snarks, the history of snarks pretty much, is that instead of having these polynomials that we met earlier, um, instead of having these polynomials transmitted with their answers, like if, instead of evaluating them on points, which you know the point of, and instead of communicating these queries and answers in the clear, this all has to be done in some way that is zero knowledge, but so the verifier can still, can still verify. So this is, actually, uh, sorry, these are really old slides. Um, wait, 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 wait. Um, okay, so the way that this happens was introduced in Groth 10 in two different forms. So Groth 10, Groth 10 introduced two different forms of a proof. One of them was designated verifier, and one was, um, Right, one was publicly verifiable, which is the type that's, for example, used in Zcash or used in like most purposes. I think that you would that you would think of for snarks to be used today. Uh, so, but the designated verifier example is kind of good too. So the as like an as education. Um, so what happens is. What happens if we could send the queries instead of just sending the queries and then having the proof sent back? 
what happens if we could send the queries encrypted, right? So in GROS10, in the designated verifier case, the verifier would have a key, he would encrypt his queries, then he would send them to the prover. The prover would be able to create the results of these queries and have proofs because these are just linear combinations of, the, of points of the proof. This is something that you can actually do with encryption, with like some sorts of encryptions that we have. Um, so this is using the tools that are available in the world. This is one way that you can communicate, right? The verifier encrypts his queries. The prover does these multiplications with encrypted values. So she never learns what the queries are. Um, and then sends over the results, which the verifier with his giant key then can, oh dear, with his, which the verifier with his giant key can then decrypt and he will then be able to do the actual verification in the clear. You see how that happens? So the decryption of something multiplied by an encryption of something else decrypted would be the multiplication times, multi like, yeah, the multiplication of the things in the clear. So the verifier can just, just verify everything in the clear. Then the other cool thing that you can do is we exist in a world with pairings. And there's another paper that works on the, um, the things that we can get from PCPs and the things we can get from QAPs, which was quadratic arithmetic programs. So the reason why I introduced these like weird polynomials, which are called quadratic arithmetic programs, is that you can, uh, you can reduce these uh, like constructions, you can make these polynomials work with the PCP theorem in a way that the verifier only ever needs to multiply together encrypted elements once. You never need to do like encryption times encryption times encryption. Um, and this is exactly what pairings allow us to do. So kind of what happens is the cryptographers um, are working with the constraints of the tools that we have. Like pairings exist, but there's nothing that exists that's like three, pairs three elements together. And so what pairings allow you to do is whereas before we had like point times element in the proof, um, pairings allow you to do this sort of encryption the way that the verifier just did, except you don't need to actually decrypt to be able to verify that the proof holds. You can still compute, yeah, you can still compute the verification algorithm in this encrypted form um, using pairings, but you can only compute, yeah, one encrypted element times another encrypted element. And with QAPs and the PCP theorem, we have exactly this and no more. So this is how GROSS16 works. And um, yeah, and GROSS16 is actually three elements. The proof is just three group elements, which is like extremely tiny. Um, this is what Zcash uses currently. This is it's like the state of the art. And one of the proof elements is kind of like a representation of all of the upper gates, if you can remember the arithmetic circuit picture. The other proof element is like representing all of the lower gates. And then the third proof element is representing consistency of the entire circuit. So like using these two other proof elements, you can make sure that every every output of a gate is equal to the multiplication of the two inputs of that gate with just three group elements. Um, and right, and this has a CRS, rather than the verifier having a key which he needs to keep to himself, this has a common reference string, which is where the trusted setup comes from in constructing this common reference string. You have to like all work together to, to produce the information. And you can kind of see now why that's the point. Like before the verifier had to have some private information, now, like there needs to be at some point private information to construct the things which are allowed to be public. Um, but then like from, from then on in the world, you can just use these public elements and seeing them doesn't like help anybody to break proofs. Um, yeah, and this is how, what's so weird? This is how proofs work in the world these days. Uh, right, so in conclusion, I don't have a conclusion slide because these are old version of slides, but uh, so, right, pretty much snarks are constructed in this way that gets uh, the, the statement that you wish to prove things about into this form which things can be proved really nicely about and very conveniently like uh, for the world that we live in, in which pairings exist. And then the second half of snark construction is like getting from this 
convenient representation to something which we can prove uh, right, while satisfying all of the properties that we spoke about at the, at the start, like non-interactivity, it's so small. Um, and it achieves, yeah, every property that you'd want from a zero-knowledge proof. So hopefully this is demystified in some part what zero-knowledge proofs are. <laughs> Thanks. Hi, so we do have time for a few quick questions. Oh, this is your laptop, not mine. Can we leave it for dinner? Wait, what, sorry? Can we leave it for dinner? Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Yay. Oh, sorry. You don't need to No, no, I don't need to talk. Hi, uh, great talk. So I would uh, like to pose a question on the um, proof size and the verification time on SNARKs versus TARKs. So um, currently the snarks, they are like of constant size, the verifier and constant time, right. while starks on the contrast, they're considered to be logarithmic. Right. Um, would you say that the constant size of the snarks, it stems from the setup phase where you essentially, if you set up big enough parameters, you can say it is constant. While, for example, if you essentially set up a big N, like a very, very large number, like right. for the Stark, right. you'd also say that it's constant, since it will always be bound by that. Right. I actually think this is a good point. So, like, Starks do grow logarithmically, right, in the size of the circuit. But, for example, if you just have a really small circuit, so maybe, the, I mean, they would still be bigger than Snarks or maybe like computationally more heavy. But I do think that like the fact they grow logarithmically doesn't have to be some, like it doesn't have to be, uh, right, it's not something that's insurmountable, right? You can still have small snarks. Yeah, you could still have small stocks, like small enough for people to, definition of small to be satisfied. Cool, yeah. thank you. Um, can I do one more? Go crazy. <laughs> um, so for probabilistically checkable proofs, right. we need to do n queries that, so that we have like a statistical, let's say, security after we give we get enough samples. Right. Um, have you considered using the recent work on vector commitments by Boons and friends to basically batch the openings of the probabilistically checkable proof so as to reduce uh, the basically communication overhead? Uh, because wait. currently you commit to a Merkle to root and you need to provide multiple Merkle branches for it. Right. While in this uh, construction, I can basically give you one constant size proof, which opens for multiple, let's say, uh, indexes on the um, route that you committed. Oh, cool. Um, wait, what was the question? <laughs> Sorry. Have you considered using it? No, no, I haven't. I didn't know about okay. it. It yeah. sounds great. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, All right, awesome. Thank you so much for Thanks. Thanks, guys.